Yum! I've got chicken for lunch. What about you, Gustine? Hmm, kangkong and talbos. Yuck! I hate vegetables. You know, if only you try it, then you'd like it. Leafy greens are just as delicious as your chicken and even more nutritious. Come on, Christine. It tastes nothing like chicken. <laughs> Again. You know what I've wondered, Christine? Yep. How do these leaves get their green color? Funny you should ask, because Miss Abby left us some readings. She said that leaves that don't just come in green get their color from pigments that absorb light, and if I remember correctly, they're called chlorophylls, and the process is called photosynthesis. Hmm. Hi, K. Hubbers. Plants are very important to us humans. They not only produce oxygen, but sometimes we use them for food and even medicine. So it's very important that we learn more about them. From Teacher Abby. Wow! Guess who's going to talk about photosynthesis? Who? None other than a world-class teacher, a well-known Filipino scientist who even has a planet named after her, the planet 13241, now called Planet Bio. Hey, hey, are we talking about Dr. Giuseppe Bio? Yep. Hi, k Havers. We eat plants and other animals for food, but do you know where plants get their own food? Today, we will learn about photosynthesis, a very important process without which life on Earth cannot be sustained. Students, look at these plants. What colors can you see? Most of the leaves are colored green. Some leaves have yellow colors, while some leaves are red. Plants possess different pigments. These pigments absorb light. The most abundant pigments in plants are chlorophylls A and B. Chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B reflect green light but absorb all other colors. That's why most of the leaves are green. Other leaves have sanctophyll or the yellow color. Others have carotin or orange color, while some of the leaves have anthocyanin which give them the red or purple color. Do you know that chlorophylls are very important not only for plants, but also for the entire ecosystem? Do you have any idea why? Yes, Alfonso? Because chlorophyll enables plants to produce food through photosynthesis, a process of capturing and transforming light energy into chemical energy. Very good! Then because chlorophyll enables plants to become autotrophs, plants not only produce food for themselves, but for the heterotrophs as well. Very good, Ashley. Mm, but what is the difference between chlorophyll A and B? Although all plant pigments absorb light, only chlorophyll A is capable of transforming light energy into chemical energy. Chlorophyll B, as well as all other pigments, cannot transform light energy into chemical energy. Thus, the light energy that they capture is passed on to chlorophyll A. Come on, let's explore and learn more about photosynthesis. Photosynthesis was first studied in the early 1600s by John van Thelman, a Flemish botanist. In his experiment, he weighed a pot of soil and planted a small willow tree in it adding only water to the pot. After five years, he found out that the tree had gained 75 kilograms 
but there was almost no change in the weight of the soil. Van Helmont believed that the new plant material came directly from water. In the late 1600s, John Woodward tested Van Helmont's hypothesis. He found out that one plant only gained one gram after the addition of 76 kilograms of water for 77 days. He concluded that most of the water was exhaled into the atmosphere. Thus, the hypothesis that water is the nutrient used by plants for growth was rejected. In 1771, Joseph Priestley, an English chemist, put a sprig of mint into a transparent closed jar with a candle that burned out of the air until it soon went out. At that time, oxygen was not yet discovered. After 27 days, he relit the extinguished candle again and it burned perfectly well in the air that previously would not support it. And how did Presley light the candle if it was placed in a closed jar? He focused sunlight beams with a mirror into the candle wick. Presley had no bright source of light and had to rely on the sun. So Presley proved that plants somehow changed the composition of the air. In another celebrated experiment in 1772, Presley kept a mouse in a jar of air until it collapsed. He found that a mouse kept with a plant inside a jar would survive. These observations led Presley to offer an interesting hypothesis that plants restore to the air whatever breathing animals and burning candles remove. This was also the first evidence that plants and animals interact with air. John Engenhouse discovered that plants give off oxygen only in the presence of sunlight. In 1779, he demonstrated this by burning up all the oxygen in the jar with a plant. He then left the plant in sunlight for a few days to restore the air. Then, without relighting the candle, he put the plant into the darkness for several more days. At the end of the dark period, he was unable to relight the candle. He concluded that a plant in darkness acts like an animal using up the oxygen that it had created. It must have breathed fouling the air and in order to purify the air, plants need light. Scientists soon found out that the growth of plants is accompanied by an increase in their carbon content. A Swiss minister, Jean Senebier, discovered that the source of this carbon is carbon dioxide and that the release of oxygen during photosynthesis accompanies the uptake of carbon dioxide. By the beginning of 1800s, scientists had identified the basic requirements for plant growth, carbon dioxide, water, and light. Mm. So that's how man learned all about photosynthesis. It sure took them a lot of time to figure out the process. Now even high school students like us are being taught all about it. Most photosynthetic process takes place in the leaf within the cell in organelles called chloroplasts. Inside the chloroplasts, the photosynthetic pigments are arranged in sacs called thylakoids. The thylakoids are arranged in sacs called grana, and the space between the grana is called the stroma. Mom, how does this process provide food for plants? That's a very good question, Alfonso. In photosynthesis, carbon dioxide and water are converted into a simple sugar called glucose using light energy. Thus, in photosynthesis, the raw materials are carbon dioxide and water. The product is a simple sugar called glucose. Oxygen and water are released as byproducts. Thus, the overall equation for photosynthesis is six molecules of carbon dioxide plus 12 molecules of water in the presence of light energy is converted into one molecule of glucose and six molecules of oxygen as well as six molecules of water are given off as byproducts. Take note that this is already the overall result of a very complicated process which we will attempt to simplify. Photosynthesis involves two phases, light-dependent reaction 
and the dark reaction. Let me explain to you the light-dependent reaction. Hmm, let me guess. As the name suggests, light is required for these reactions to take place. Very good, Lorenzo. Light supplies the energy for this reaction to occur. The light reaction of photosynthesis takes place in the grana where there is abundance of light energy. The chlorophyll is composed of two units, photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. When a photosystem 1 chlorophyll absorbs light, its electrons get excited and are released. These electrons are passed through an electron transfer chain to convert NADP or nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate to NADPH2, a high energy molecule. This photosystem 2 chlorophylls replenish these electrons by the following process. When a photosystem 2 chlorophyll absorbs light, it breaks down water to oxygen, hydrogen ions, and electrons. These electrons are passed through an electron transport chain to make adenosine triphosphate or ATP, another high energy molecule. Finally, these electrons are passed on to the electron deficient photosystem 1 chlorophyll to enable it to function again, and the cycle goes on. So one cycle uses up one water molecule, one photosystem generates NADPH, the other ATP. Very good! These two high energy molecules are used to power up the next process of photosynthesis, which is the dark reaction. The dark reactions take place in the stroma. There, carbon dioxide, an inorganic compound, is used to form glucose, an organic compound. This process is called carbon fixation, which occurs by a series of enzyme-controlled reactions called the Calvin cycle. Six carbon dioxide molecules react with six ribulose phosphate molecules to form 12 phosphoglyceric acid molecules, which is further converted into phosphoglyceraldehyde by using up 12 ATPs and 12 NADPH2 from the light reactions. Two of these phosphoglyceraldehyde molecules form one molecule of glucose. The other 10 are used to replenish six ribulose phosphate molecules to react with carbon dioxide again. I noticed that both the light and dark reactions happened in cycles to ensure the continuity of the photosynthetic process. Also, as a summary, the dark reactions use up to six molecules of carbon dioxide to form one molecule of glucose. If this process uses up 12 molecules each of NADPH and ADP, then it must mean that 12 light reaction cycles or 12 water molecules are required for every Calvin cycle. Very good, students. In our general equation, there are six water molecules in the product. Where does this come from? Remember that one cycle in photosystem one of the light reactions produced a hydrogen ion. In 12 cycles, 12 of these react with oxygen to form 6 molecules of water. Notice that all these reactions eventually sum up to form our general equation. For every 1 molecule of glucose and 6 molecules of water form, 6 molecules of carbon dioxide and 12 molecules of water are required. Mm, Ma'am, water appears both as a reactant and product in our equation. Why can't we just cancel them out and write six water molecules as reactants? If we do that, our equation will still be balanced. However, this will falsely imply that we only use six molecules of water in one full cycle of photosynthesis. You are aware that we need 12 molecules of water for one cycle of photosynthesis to happen. That's why we cannot cancel this out. Who would have thought that such intricate process could take place in a small leaf and in such short time? The glucose that these plants produce provides them with energy for maintenance and growth. And don't forget, these are the same leaves that provide food for animals, humans, and practically the whole ecosystem. See how a little leaf can make such a big difference? That's why we have to protect our forest and plant more trees. Without plants to carry out photosynthesis, we can never manufacture food on our own. Bye, K-Havers! Bye! Bye. Six CO2 plus 12 H2O C6 
H1206 plus 6O2 plus 6H2O. This is the equation of photosynthesis. <sighs> That's a lot to look at. Just so plants can get their green color? <sighs> I still don't get it. Let me explain it to you in simple terms. But first, let's grab our dessert. So tell me, Christine, what's this equation all about? Simply put, that equation just means that in photosynthesis, carbon dioxide and water that are present in plants are converted into simple sugar glucose and oxygen using energy that comes from light. Light is required to ensure the process of photosynthesis. Now I understand. It's how plants get their food so they can be healthy enough to eat again. That's right. When you look at vegetables, you're not just going to see them as leafy greens. You would know that they are green because they have chlorophyll in them, which is responsible for their color. Definitely. Now I understand the reason why they look like they do. Now if I eat them, I'm going to feel so much stronger. Because I'll be eating the sunlight they eat too. That's right. Good that you are now open to eating leafy greens to give you strength. It's like being open-minded to modern biological issues that will help us in our progress. It's always good not just to know about these things around us, but to understand that as well. That's why science and biology are so cool. Definitely cool. <laughs>